guys, let's uh, get this uh, presentation underway. Um, for those of you who uh, don't know me, my name is uh, David Zarling. I'm with uh, Client First Tax and Wealth Advisors. I'm the head of investment strategy and research. Uh, this presentation is part of our Lunch and Learn series that we do on a monthly basis, uh, typically the third Wednesday of every month. Um, we have it out uh, near our place, near the Columbian. Um, if you're interested in getting on our list, you can do that by going to clientfirsttaxandwealth.com or you can call us at 262-335-1700 or even shoot us an email, uh, my team at clientfirsttaxandwealth.com. But these are great events. Uh, we get together, we eat some good food. Uh, we talk about some important and timely topics at the time. Every quarter, it's my responsibility to give some insights that we're seeing going on in the marketplace uh, using our adaptive system. And so that's what we're gonna do today. But of course, before I get too far, uh, we should cover some uh, legalese. Obviously, we don't know everybody watching this video. Um, you know, of course, we know our clients, and that's our job to know our clients, but we don't know everybody watching this video. And so we don't know your personal situation, so it is really important that you don't use this information uh, for investment decisions. It's really meant to provide illustration and education, so please uh, consume it accordingly. With that out of the way, I always like to start with a, a quick story with how I think this is going to tie in with uh, what we're going to talk about today. And these pictures on here remind me of an awesome trip that my wife Emily and I got to take out to Colorado. Uh, it was at the end of February. Um, what we were going to was something called Chart Summit. It's where uh, people like myself who use price and charts to make investment decisions. Um, there was a conference out there and the format was you ski from basically eight in the morning to two in the afternoon, and then you conference from three in the afternoon till you know whenever you want, like six p.m. and then networking after that. It was a great, uh, great event. A lot of things learned, uh, but we also had a great time. You, you might notice my my kids are not in the picture here with me and Emily, so it was one night, nice long date for us. Uh, we really enjoyed it. But the reason why I have these other pictures on here is um, while the event itself was awesome. Uh, getting there can be a challenge, right? You have a destination to get to. And this is uh, a map, a snapshot I took of um, the weather that was going on at that time. And in fact, we were scheduled to fly out on a Thursday morning uh, early. And we got a text the night before saying our flight had been canceled. And rightfully so, because this whole storm system was actually on the, on the western side of the United States. We're trying to get from Milwaukee to Denver. Uh, there's snowstorms everywhere, blizzards. Um, you know, they made a decision that it wasn't safe for us to fly. There was more risk than reward. And so we were grounded. We didn't get to fly out until that evening, Thursday evening, which then bumped us off of a shuttle that was going to take us from Denver Airport to our ski resort, which was about an hour and a half away. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to take a shuttle until the following morning. So we found the last uh, four wheel drive vehicle that we could find. Um, in Denver and that's what we decided so we eventually did get out uh, of Milwaukee Thursday evening we got to Denver we found our rental car we hopped in and as soon as we hit uh, the mountains uh, I could barely see 20 feet in front of us whether it was fog or snow uh, it was quite something and I was extremely happy to have my four-wheel drive vehicle right you gotta have the right tools uh, to get you to your destination um, of course there were huge snow plows out in front of us but one of the funny stories was uh, a presenter that was at Chart Summit uh, had tried to take an Uber that same evening from Denver to the summit and the Uber driver quit, unfortunately, halfway through and left him in a town and someone had to come get him. So he was a day late for his presentation, but it kind of gives you an idea of we don't always get to deal with sunny skies. We might really enjoy getting to our destination, but there's times where we need to land the plane, not fly the plane, and there's times where we need four-wheel drive and maybe not drive at all. And that's a little bit what we're gonna talk about today because when we talk about um, markets, what we're gonna cover today for our first quarter insights is we're gonna talk about what portfolio audio, autopilot is. Um, that's currently the, um, how the process works in our industry today and how would that handle market turbulence. We're also gonna review our adaptive system how we think about things a little bit differently with portfolio, portfolio construction. We're gonna talk a little bit about, do we need to hit 100%? You know, it's baseball season now, it's beautiful weather. Uh, we've got games going on. Do we need to bat 1,000? Do we need to get a hit every single time to be a successful 
um, manager of assets to generate returns, and we're going to cover that. We're also going to cover some market insights. You know, are we cleared for takeoff now? You know, we had that 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 really nice severe correction back in Q4. The beginning of this year, we've had a really nice rebound. Uh, you know, if you want to call it a V bottom and straight up. Um, so, are we clear for takeoff, or do we need to fasten seatbelts? Um, and then, normally, we open it up for questions and answers. But what I'll do is encourage you to go ahead and reach out to me. Uh, reach out to us here at Client First. Uh, I love talking about this stuff, so we'd love to meet, uh, get to know you, uh, and answer any questions you might have. And then we've got some final thoughts before we, we wrap up the video. But really what I want to start out with is the mo what I believe is the most crowded trade on the planet. And, he and here's what I mean by that. Um, maybe a few uh, years ago, my wife and I, uh, we built up the courage to go see Imagine Dragons at Summerfest. Summerfest is this big music f festival in the lake near Milwaukee. Uh, supposedly it's the biggest in the world. I have no idea because I haven't been to all the other music fests, but it's pretty big. And we went to go see Imagine Dragons. And uh, I can't remember the year exactly, but it was packed. I mean, so packed that um, you, you, you couldn't tell where the picnic tables were because when you looked across the crowd, um, all you saw were like little bumps and that's that's where the picnic tables were is because the crowd if you just looked across the heads of people they rose and fall with the terrain uh, it was pretty awesome but it's also a little bit nerve-wracking right you could be um, a little nervous in a crowded theater or a crowded concert and even Emily and my wife we did we took notice of where the exits were in case something bad were to happen and how we're gonna get out and it's the same thing in markets sometimes things get tilted in such a way uh, or, or in one type of trade that you have to be very aware that it's a small exit because so many people are in that particular trade. And what I'm specifically talking about is how our industry currently sets up portfolios which tends to um, be centered around a 60-40 portfolio, 60% bonds, 40% stocks, and then the portfolio construction process. And so I kind of wanted to go over that with you. I wanted to go through, okay, how are portfolios normally set up within the industry? And then compare it to how we do it here at Client First, which is a differentiator for us. So here's an example, and I'm giving you a visual representation here of what most of the industry does. And, and, and I'm not pointing out anything that's necessarily bad. I just want to point out some things that are different and why I have some concerns about uh, the way our industry does things as a whole. But you know, step one when you meet with a with a person um, is you want to evaluate their goals and objectives. That's a really good thing you want to do. From that, you're going to determine their risk tolerance. Um, one of the big things in our industry is we give people a risk number. Um, to me, it kind of reminds me of giving someone a DMV number. Uh, it's a, to me cramming someone into a certain number uh, may not necessarily be appropriate, but I get why they do it. Um, and then from that, they they do what's called design a a custom, uh, quote unquote, custom portfolio. And I'll get into this in a moment, but really um, I put that in quotes because yes, they're gonna create a portfolio that's tailored for you, uh, but there, it may not actually be all that custom because it's typically gonna be tilted around the concept of a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio. Then what they'll do is they'll uh, monitor and rebalance the portfolio which is a fancy way, rebalance is a fancy way of saying, hey, we're going to cut the winners and add to the losers. Uh, we actually do the opposite here and we'll get into that. We like to let the winners run and cut the losers. Um, then of course, it's always good to measure performance and report results and rinse and repeat that cycle. Um, you know, it's, it's it, it, one of the things I wanna point out in this that I have a problem with in our industry is a lot of times it's a static portfolio cor uh, construction. And, and what do I mean by that? First, let's step into um, what I mean by a 60-40 portfolio and why it may have been relevant at one point and probably isn't so much right now. So 60-40 portfolio, most popular trade on the planet. Um, when we look at it back in 1980, your yield on a 10-year bond was around 11% and the dividends you got on stocks were around 13%. So your implied portfolio return was about 12 and a half percent. I mean, that's pretty awesome back in 1980. But you look at that data now, and a 10-year bond gets you around 2%, and 
and your stock's dividend, you know, your dividends are around 4% and the implied portfolio return is 3.6%. So to me, um, maybe 60-40 portfolio isn't the best portfolio to have. And so I guess jumping back into this part number three of designing a custom portfolio, another thing that happens is what they'll do is say, say Mr. Mr. Client A, um, what we're gonna do is in, in this section here, in your bond section, okay, we're gonna hold some municipal bonds in there for you, and then in the stock portion, we're gonna have some in international and we're gonna have some small caps um, because you're a little bit more aggressive. So it's, it's custom, but it's still divided up into this 60-40 scenario, whereas they might have another client um, that comes in and they're a little more conservative, so they, you know, maybe they're gonna do some blue chip stocks in here, some dividend paying, and we're gonna look at some short duration bonds and put them in here. So it's 60-40, but it's a different type of 60-40. So yes, it's custom, but it's not custom. It's custom in the fact that what's in each pie piece is gonna be probably unique to that person. Um, and the reason why I believe that's a little bit problematic in itself is if you imagine a place that has 200 uh, clients, you're now looking at a how many different positions, right? Because if everybody's got a custom portfolio, that's a little bit like saying, I'm going to make 200 different types of cars, and then I'm gonna promise you that I'm gonna be able to maintain that thing. Uh, that seems a little bit inefficient to me, and we do things a little bit differently. But, you know, jumping back into this, um, after the portfolio is created, we understand these next steps that come in here. Um, what I wanna do is kind of jump jump ahead a little bit here and kind of review last year um, a difference between the adaptive system and a, a typical 60-40 portfolio, which you can actually buy an ETF right here, AOR, that is 60% uh, stocks and 40% bonds. Last year, um, it had an almost negative 6% return. And I, I don't want to give the Im implication that a 60-40 portfolio is down every year. It's absolutely not. In fact, the, the majority of the time, it's not. Um, it last year was a unique experience where the 60-40 portfolio was down. In fact, October of 2018 was the worst performing year for, or worst performing month for a 60-40 portfolio. What I'm pointing out to you is that even a 60-40 portfolio is subject to risk. Um, typically people think, well, when stocks rise, the bonds will fall a little bit and then you can rebalance into those bonds, right, at a, and, and receive a higher yield. And then when stocks fall, bonds go up, and that balances each other out and gives you a smoother ride. Well, that is true. Um, however, there are environments where stocks and bonds rise together and they fall together. Um, it's not one or the other. And you know, we were truly humbled last year that we could have a positive return in our models, in our adaptive models. And these are all numbers that are after fees, and I'm providing it for comparison purposes just to show you, and we'll get into it a little bit, a real world example of what a portfolio looked like and how I can show you that we don't use autopilot, which is different than a lot of the industry. And just for comparison purposes, you know, if you were to say, you know, a 60-40 portfolio, uh, the illustration I'm using was down 5.8% last year, you know, on a million dollar account, that's a loss of uh, $58,000. Um, you know, adaptive growth was up 5.1, that's a gain of 51. That's a net benefit on a million dollar account of about 109,000, that's real money. Um, our moderate, um, also similar thing, net benefit of almost $100,000. That's, you know, a, a significant difference. And really, um, I'm showing this because adaptive growth and adaptive moderate are where 95% of our clients um, are based out of for their models. And it does a good job showing how a, a, a drawdown, a significant drawdown, can have implications um, in it, it versus something that's, that has a positive return. It's not exactly um, an easy thing to cover, but I wanted to show it to you. It's just for illustrative purposes. And I guess I wanted then to use this to jump into how we um, look at portfolios, how we go about our process. So here's our process that we're looking at here, the true holistic planning process. And you notice that some of them are uh, similar steps. You know, we are gonna meet with you um, and evaluate your goals and objectives. It's not just gonna be a form or a computer that you fill out, it's gonna be a conversation. 
We're going to talk about your past experiences, what you're hoping to achieve, your goals and objectives. We're not just going to spit out a risk number to you. Um, we're going to do that through the planning process. And part of that is we use a true holistic planning process that divides money up on time horizon, right? There's money that you need now, there's money that you need soon, and there's money you need later. Um, there's a difference in how each of those buckets of money could be invested. And for us, that later bucket money, later being you know three to 10 years time down the road that you're gonna access it, it can have a little more risk associated with it. And we're gonna use the adaptive system to manage the money that's in that later bucket. In that later bucket, we have five models. Okay, so we're not creating uh, 200 different custom portfolios and losing track of them because uh, we can't possibly monitor them all at once. But we're gonna use five models, anywhere from ultra conservative to growth. And they all the, the difference between them is the size of the pie, the pieces of pie that they have. You know, for example, if growth is holding a 25% position in technology, um, you know, ultra growth is gonna have not even close to half to half of that. But it allows us to manage more efficiently based on risk tolerance one of these models. And rather than 200 positions, we're actually managing more like 10 positions or less. And so that's a really important concept to understand. And then we're always gonna be adaptive with that. We're gonna be using our main uh, points of data, which is price itself, which helps us identify trend and helps us identify relative strength, right? Because we need to know there's 30,000 different things we could invest in in the United States as American investors. How do we possibly know what to invest in? And we have to have a process for that, and we're gonna cover that as well. And we always wanna ongoing manage risk. Um, what I mean by that is we're gonna cut losers, we're gonna let winners run, and we're gonna view cash as a position too. Um, that's also a huge, huge difference between us and a lot of different firms. Uh, many places, um, when they set up, set up a portfolio, um, whether it's 60-40 or something very close to it, they're then going to um, allow that. You're just going to have to buy and hold. You're going to have to hold on to that position. Uh, they're not going to raise cash. Um, any type of market correction, you're just going to uh, ride that out. And so we don't view that as a, as a great option, and I'll cover that uh, in a little bit and why we think that is. So why don't we jump into how the adaptive system operates. Um, that will give you guys a really good idea of the way we think about things, the way we manage money. This is very unique to us. Um, we use it for our clients. And what I'm gonna jump into for some of you is probably review, but that's okay. Uh, for some of you, this is gonna be brand new. Um, if you have questions, you can also reach out to me. But price is our, our first and foremost, our fact, right? Um, you know, this is a, a price chart of the S&P 500. If you're not familiar with it, it stands for Standard & Poor's 500. Most people are familiar with the Dow Jones Industrial Average. That's 30 stocks, S&P 500, 500 stocks. And it does a very good job giving us um, what US large cap stocks are doing. And we can see, this chart goes back to late 90s. I could have gone back to early 1900s, but I don't like to overwhelm people. But we can see supply and demand happening, right? Price uh, is economics 101, uh, the interaction of supply and demand, more supply than demand. Price drops, more demand than supply, price rises. And this happens over and over and over in markets. And the reason why we use price is uh, we've never seen it restated. You know, you might get a GDP number, you might get an employment number, you might get an earnings number from a company that is later restated. Uh, price is a fact, it never gets restated. You know, if your neighbor down the street sells their house, um, you may disagree with what the price is, but that doesn't change the fact of what the price is. It was an agreement between a buyer and a seller in a moment of time, and that is the final arbiter of value. Same thing in markets. We may or may not like what the market is doing, but the market doesn't care what we think. Um, it's gonna do what it's gonna do because it's the interaction of all market participants, their buying urgency or their selling urgency that's interacting and creating price movement, okay? And so we can't really argue with it. I like pointing out that you know, it, it's not like they're gonna, they may restate, restate earnings or restate GDP, but they're never gonna restate the chart or restate price. You know, the, the, they're not gonna come up to me and say, hey, you know that, that price you paid for Apple stock two years ago, it was actually this price. That never happens. So we're gonna use price because it's fact. Once in a while, I get individuals who say, oh, well, you're gonna use this, but this is information from the past 
And this is where I get a little bit, you know, sassy with people and say, well, you know, show me your time machine because you must be using information from the future. None of us has information from the future to use. If you do, let me know. That'd be an interesting conversation. But for us, everybody is using information from the past. We're going to use the most up-to-date, most factual piece of data, and that's price itself. So price, that's why we use it. Now trend, what do we use to identify trend? For us, this blue line that's running through price here is the prior 40 weeks of information averaged. Okay, So the prior 40 weeks of price in this particular asset, the S&P 500, that's what this blue line is. What it helps us do is helps us um, eliminate daily and weekly noise. You know, if you if you were to watch this video with your nose right on the screen, you're not going to be re really able to see what's going on. You need to step back and, and have it away from you so you can see. That's what the blue line does for us. Are we in a general uptrend or are we in a general downtrend? We want to know that information because we want to invest with the trend and avoid being in a counter trend or a downtrend. So that's why we use it. Now, how can we use it more effectively? What we do is we combine it with this orange line that's on here now. That's the prior 10 weeks of information averaged, right? So the blue line, 40 weeks, orange line, 10 weeks of information. And what we know from, from all the past history is that when orange is below blue, that's when bad things tend to happen. It doesn't guarantee bad things, okay? It doesn't guarantee a market correction. But all market corrections have that characteristic. It's very similar to saying, we know it's below 32 degrees, we know there's precipitation, maybe we shouldn't drive, right? Because it, it, you can drive in snow and it's not gonna necessarily cause an accident, but we know the odds of an accident increase when you drive in snow, same way. When orange is below blue, we see volatility pick up, we see selling pick up, it's not a great environment to be invested in. And so what we simply do, is we have a, a general sweeping rule that when orange is below blue, we're gonna take caution, okay? We're gonna protect accounts. This is where we can take on larger positions of cash, maybe entirely cash, and protect from these big moves down, right? We wanna be in the business of protecting from 30, 40, 50% drawdowns, but yet still participate when the market's in an uptrend and capture those gains during that time frame. I'd like to zoom into this area here. Uh, this is an orange and blue back in December, orange cross below blue, just recently orange cr cross back above blue, uh, a positive development recently, it was a negative development back then. Again, it didn't guarantee that a massive correction had to be underwear, underway, but it was definitely a period of increased risks and one of the reasons why we raised cash for our clients and protected their accounts during this period of time. So why do we use this? Why even bother with the extra effort in managing accounts actively this way? Well, I like to tell people that maybe if we're blessed or lucky, we get to pick where we live when we retire. We don't get to pick the market we get when we retire. And I'd like to point out that this chart of the S&P 500, which your, uh, an account would be exposed to th some of or all of this because it'd be invested in US stocks, some portion of it, a retirement account exposed to this. Um, you know, that This is 13 years, this is the year 2000, this is 2008, here's, um, 2013, and you'll notice that price went nowhere but heartburn, okay? Minus 46% drop, it took an 85% gain to get back to even. Minus 57% drop, took 132% to get back to even. That's just to get back to even. This type of market environment, while that may be great when you're in your 20s, 30s, even 40s, because your dollar cost averaging in at lower prices, this is extremely detrimental to a retirement plan. To have your account cut in half is not acceptable, not in your best interest, because you need to start accessing and taking distributions of that money. And so that's why we use the adaptive system, right? Because the more drawdowns you have, the more problematic it becomes as you take distributions on those monies. So, you know, to drive this, uh, this uh, point home, you know, just a 20% drop, which we just had in quarter four, took a 25% return to get back to even. That is the math behind it. Many people don't talk about this, right? From October of 2018 through Christmas Eve 2018 was a minus 20% drop. We just got back to even, but it took a 25% return just to get back there. So this shows you, you know, the, the detriment that some of these things can have. You know, 
man, a 70% return you've got to have, or loss, you've got to have a 233% return to just get back to even. And that's why we use those orange and blue rules. We'd rather be on the ground wishing we were in the air than the other way around. Okay, we're going to take an abundance of caution, right? Because there's periods like 2017 where there's friendly skies and we can capture those gains and we can be participating in it. But there's also years like uh, 2018 where there's turbulence, okay? And we have to manage that accordingly. We can't um, just blindly fly the plane, put it on auto autopilot, own our 60-40 portfolio and just pretend everything's okay. That's not, how, that's not how the world works. It's not how markets work. And so I wanna show you a little bit of a real world example of a client who we got permission from to include this information. This is a chart from our portal. It shows their account balance, how it performed from January 1st, 2018 through April 16th, 2019. It's a real model. I obviously remove their name because they don't need their information over the internet. But what I want to point out here is this blue line that's running through here. That is the rolling one-year return. What I mean by that is if I take my cursor and I say, okay, I'm going to put this on right here. Okay, that's a 10% return at that moment in time looking back one year. So that's you know maybe uh, late January uh, 2018 at that point in time. You know, it's a 10% it's a one year look back period. Um, that's, what, that's what that represents. Or, you know, maybe I can put my cursor here. This is, you know, sometime a little bit after April, from April 2018 going back one year, that's gonna give me uh, my return, which is approximately, you know, positive 5% at that time. So, digging into this a little bit more, what I wanna point out is December of 2018 or quarter four, you can notice, notice how we're using, we're participating um, in the growth of the market itself, right? Because the S&P 500 is in black. Our growth benchmark, a 60-40, or I'm sorry, a, almost a 75-25 portfolio is in gray. We're riding along with that trend until the trend changes, and this is where things get different. We land the plane, we protect accounts. At its most negative point, the market drawdown, December, uh, 24th at that point in time right looking back one year was about a minus almost 12 percent return while this individual was up five percent that is a dramatic difference um, especially if you can imagine you've got to take a five thousand dollar distribution in here to fund what whatever you have going on in your retirement account or your retirement or your plan um, that's future earnings lost, whereas taking a, a $5,000 distribution is much better up in this area here. But this proves the point that we can protect account accounts, and when they start to trend again, we can participate again. Um, and this was a rapid, rapid correction, and the adaptive system showed that it could adapt to the market environment that was in front of us during that period of time. And so this is the difference between being adaptive and correcting, uh, protecting accounts versus autopilot where you're just owning it, buying and holding it and watching your account drop. You know, from this high in October to this low, the whole market was down about 20%. Um, that's a pretty big deal. And so we like to highlight this and show you a real world example of what an account looks like uh, during, this, during um, turbulent times, if you will. We can protect accounts. We don't have to be static on autopilot and just buy and hold and we can protect accounts using the tools uh, that we have, and we're gonna do that. So that was important to show you, and then I wanna jump into here the power of relative strength. So we talked about price, we talked about trend, and now I wanna talk a little bit about relative strength um, because it, it's a powerful concept to understand, and some of this, again, is gonna be a refresher for you guys. This is um, an, an analysis of, of Coke versus Pepsi, right? You know, this is me trying to be clever. Back in the day, they had those commercials where they blindfolded people and, you know, they did a taste test. And I always tell people each one is, a little, each one is pretty good with a little bit of rum. But all we're going to do is go through, should we own Coke stock or should we own Pepsi stock? And then that's going to give you a really good um, idea of how we think about this in a, in a bigger way. So this is a price chart of Coke stock and it's 2016 and 2017 are the years. No significance to that period of time, it's just when I put this together. And we can see buying and selling taking place within the, within the Coke stock, perfectly normal. And when we compare it side by side with Pepsi, 
Um, very hard to get a gauge on whether we should own one or the other. And what we do to solve that is we create a math problem and then we solve it. We take the price of Coke stock, divide it by the price of Pepsi stock, which gives us a new number. That new number is a ratio and it travels on a chart and it looks like this. And what we know for mathematical certainty is when the ratio is falling, okay, when the ratio is falling, that means Pepsi is doing better than Coke. And when the ratio is rising, Coke is doing better than Pepsi. So that's great information. Where this becomes more powerful is we can use tools like our orange and blue lines to give us some better discipline and rules. For example, in this relationship, we can say when orange is above blue, we're going to own Coke stock. When orange is below blue, we can own Pepsi stock. And then we can switch back to Coke stock. To prove that point, by owning Pepsi stock from here to here, while well, Coke's up almost 4%, Pepsi's up 10. We like 10% better than 4%. And then we can switch to Coke stock here, which is up a percent and a half while Pepsi's down four and a half. And so that gives you a really good idea of how we think about this. And we can do this on a much bigger scale, right? If we think of markets like a loaf of bread, you know, most places, 401ks or even uh, other uh, advisors, they might divide it up and say, okay, we've got large cap stocks, mid cap stocks, small cap stocks. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. We can do Coke and Pepsi analysis between these different things, perfectly normal. And that may help us to be in large caps and not small caps, or sometimes be in mid caps more than small caps. But we can also slice the loaf of bread traditionally, right? We can have a slice of technology that has technology stocks in it, like Apple or Google, those types of companies. We can have a slice that's utilities and it has we energies in it, a slice that's healthcare that has United Healthcare in it, or a slice that has financials and it has Bank of America and JP Morgan in it. Um, you know, a slice of real estate, a slice of energy, Exxon and Chevron are, are in there. And we can compare all these slices against each other using that Coke Pepsi analysis, right? And identify two very important things the slices that are doing well and that we want to own, but also the slices that are moldy. An example of that would have been the Coke Pepsi analysis would have shown very clearly in 2014 through 2016, early 2016, that energy should not be in the portfolio. And during that time, energy was down a substantial amount and that can really hurt portfolio returns. And so we want to get energy out of the portfolio at that time. Same thing, we can think about this globally, right? You know, the, the world is a flow chart for capital. It doesn't have to be all US all the time. We can compare these different loaves in different countries and say, should we have some international exposure? So it was the Coke Pepsi analysis that helped us identify in 2017 to own international stocks, okay, which were great performers for our clients during that year. But it, that Coke Pepsi analysis, that relative strength analysis was also what prevented us from owning international in 2018, which was a big underperformer with some areas of the world down 20 to 50%. Um, I'm looking at you, Argentina, that was down uh, dramatically last year. So it's very important to understand the combination of these concepts, right? When by using orange and blue, by using trend, by using those orange and blue lines, by using relative strength, we can identify risk versus reward. We can invest with the direction of the trend, which puts probabilities on our side. We can manage risk using weight of evidence and position sizing. We can stay disciplined to the system and the hard data, which is price, right? And that conveniently also acronym also ties to the adaptive investment management system. And really the, what we're going to have is outcomes. Okay. The goals for our outcomes with any position we take within the portfolio is either a big win, a small win, or a small loss. The one that you'll notice is missing from there is the big loss. Okay. By using these tools, our goal is to eliminate the big loss, which that is what hurts portfolio returns, our big losses within it. Okay, so that kind of leads me to this next point. Do we have to have uh, hit a thousand with every pos uh, position we take? Do we have to, every tr single trade or new position that we take, does it have to be 100% successful? And here I've got Christian Yelich as our example. Um, last year's 2018 MVP, almost 600 you know, slugging percentage. And slugging percentage is really just a measure of 
how productive or efficient a hitter is with the hits they have. And really what they're doing is they're saying you get, you know, you get a you get a one for a single, you get a two for a double, you get a three for a triple, and you get four for a home run. As as an example, if somehow, in some way, the Brewers said on opening day they want me to lead off the game, you're gonna get to hit and hijack a home run, right? My slugging percentage is four. Okay, because I've got four total bases. I probably retire. I retire with a better slugging percentage than Christian Yelich and I go away a happy man. But my point in this is it's about how efficient you are or how productive you are with the hits you have. Same thing with the trades. Remember we were talking about big win, small win, small loss. It's avoiding those negative events. Okay, that's a big deal. To drive that point, point home further, when we look at historical players from the past who had high slugging percentages, okay, this is kind of the who's who of hitters here. It's a great data point, right? Babe Ruth, all-time greatest, 68 on a slugging percentage. You know, just to give you a, you know, a look, Christian Yelich would have been right in here. So it's pretty amazing some of these things that these guys were supposed to, or that these guys did. And then I love this chart because this is uh, Ted Williams and it's from his own notebook. He took a lot of notes on his own hitting um, after he would hit. He had a 634 career slugging percentage, which means he was extremely efficient when he hit the ball. Now this chart here, it shows his batting average, okay? When a ball was thrown into the strike zone, how he fared against that pitch when it came into certain areas of the, in, the, in the strike zone. And you'll notice it was very evident that he stayed on point, right? He focused on his relative strength, where he stood the best chance of hitting efficiently. Low and away, right? Makes sense, he didn't hit too well, but he focused and he knew that, right? So he would stay away from the bad potential positions to take, the bad potential strikes that would come in. He'd focus on the meat pitches. And by that way, he could hit better, right? Higher average, higher slugging percentage in the Hall of Fame, one of the best hitters the world has ever seen. We can compare that and identify that we don't have to bat a thousand, right? If we risk, for example, 1%, knowing that our reward is 2%, we only have to be right 33% of the time. We only have to win 33% of the time to break even, okay? And I won't tell you exactly what we aim for, but I'll tell you we're in the area of aiming for risking a one to three scenario, okay? Or a one to five scenario, which means we don't have to be right all the time. We can be right some of the time and still generate returns. The way we do that is by managing risk, by knowing our exit, right? We talked about at the beginning of the presentation, knowing where our exit is before we enter the trade. That's exactly what we do on every new position we take, is we need to know when are we wrong and when are we on the, when are we on the wrong side of the trade. So for example, if we were gonna buy something that was $50, and we know that we're wrong, and I, I don't wanna get into how we know this part because that's some of our uh, proprietary information, but if we identify before we even enter that we're wrong below $45, our risk, right, is five bucks. Five bucks on 50 is a risk of 10%. We want to know that the upside, potential upside reward can be 20% or greater, right? Because 20% is twice what we're risking, which is 10%. So we, those are the positions we wanna put ourselves in where it's asymmetric. It's in the favor of reward over risk. And the proper risk management outcomes then with this is either a big win, a small win, or a small loss. No big losses, right? We're not holding on to GE forever because we think it's gonna come back. Or we're not gonna double down and add on to some losing position because we think it's gonna come back. No, we take asymmetric risk reward scenarios and we put them in play within the portfolio and we act accordingly. So we do not need to bat a thousand generate rate returns. We just need to manage risk, downside risk, know when we're wrong, and exit that position when it's not appropriate, when the risk outweighs the reward, and hold on to the position when the reward outweighs the risk. And so that's what we do with our process. Now I kind of want to jump into, you know, we use a weight of evidence approach. You know, we want to look at 
all sorts of uh, different data points that come from price. And we want to weigh it and just kind of get a semblance of the landscape. You know, are we flying into a storm? Is there risk? I mean, markets are always filled with risk, but how much risk is there? Um, can we participate in the trend or is it time to protect? And so is it time to fasten our seatbelts? You know, when last presentation I gave, we talked about these double digit drops that had happened in previous fourth quarters, right? Because we're market historians, we're gonna look at some of the data that's happened from the past. You know, when we had a, a 13% drop or more in the fourth quarter, these are the other periods of time that it took place. You know, 08 financial crisis, Black Monday, energy crisis, World War II, you know, Great Depression, all, all these things, these are, do not give you warm and fuzzy feelings and that's what happened in 2018. So was it just a glitch or something else? And so we want to look at the data and keep an open mind. It doesn't have to be these bad things. We just want to be looking for evidence on, on what exactly is going on. So and what, what could be the cause for concern? I know people like to get focused on TV about some of these things. You know, they'll talk about Brexit, which I think is such an interesting scenario. I mean, could you imagine voting on a refer referendum that you want your represented leaders to carry out and they're not carrying it out? That would drive me nuts. So I don't know what that means for United Kingdom. I don't know what that means for Europe, uh, but we can use price to, to identify what's going on there. Are there issues with revolving corporate debt or is there big regulations coming for technology companies? Is there something unknown lurking? Here, here's, the, here's the fact. We won't know the answer to any of these questions until the move is over, until the price move is over. Price moves first, then we get the news. It's not the other way around. By the time information reaches the public airwaves, okay, whether it's on TV, whether it's on the internet, it's too late, okay? That information has already been acted on and that's why we use price because it's the first mover. Price first, news second. So what are some things we're looking at in price? Well, if we look at some major markets across the United States, whether it's the Dow Jones, which is the most popular, right? It's 30 large stocks, very correlated to the S&P 500. Um, or we look at the NASDAQ, technology companies or the Wilshire 5000, which isn't actually 5,000 stocks, but it represents basically the entire U.S. stock market or the New York Stock Exchange, which has both U.S. stocks and what's called ADR stocks, uh, international companies that are raising funds in the United States or small caps, right? If we look at small cap companies in the United States, we're right up into areas of potential resistance. What I mean by that is this is areas where sellers have shown up before, right? If you notice, right, they sold here. These are areas of previous selling and now we're coming back up into those areas, right? That can happen all the time, right? If you think about it psychologically, if someone owns stocks up in here and they're part of this 20% drop and they finally get back to even, what are they doing? They're selling. So this is an area where potential sellers could show up. We don't know if they will, um, but they, they could. And so we keep that in mind. We're at a point where sellers have shown up before, will they again, right? We have small caps lagging behind. All these other areas are, are up to their highs or even making new highs, but what, yet we have a little more international focused um, stock exchange that's lagging behind and small caps that are lagging behind. So. Are these larger cap companies going to catch down towards these other ones or are these going to catch up towards um, the larger cap or international? We actually don't know. Uh, we just monitor price and we look at that. What about internals of the market? What I, what I mean by that is if we look at market internals like breath, right? If we look at, at what is going on with the individual stocks within a stock market, right? Because it's not just a stock market, it's a market of stocks, right? If you were to watch a marathon from an aerial view, right, you know it's early in the race because all the runners are together. It's towards the end of the race where the, re the runners are spread apart, okay? There's some that are leading, very small pack. There's a bunch that have fallen back. Same thing in markets. We can see, and I use data to identify, is it just a few stocks holding up the whole stock market as a whole? Or are there other, is it, is it a joint effort? Is everything together? And so here, this is a, a new highs minus new lows. And so what we're doing is we're tallying up all the new highs on a day, we're subtracting out all the new lows on the day, and we're adding that up over time. And what you'll notice is sometimes we get these divergences. 
and they may not mean anything until price confirms it. In 2000, we had this scenario where the market was making new highs while breath was falling. So participation by stocks was falling. Fewer and fewer stocks were participating in this move. Same thing here. As price is making new high, fewer and fewer stocks are participating. We have something similar right now. Stocks are, the stock market is back to its, its highs. The amount of stocks that are participating in that has waned, okay? So it may mean something, it may mean nothing. Um, you know, if, if price starts to sell off here, if the leaders start to sell off, that will be good information and we'll need to act accordingly. Now on the flip side, right, do we need to, we need to look at evidence on the other side? Are we cleared for takeoff? Okay, so we need to look at both the positives and the negatives and you weigh that information, use our price trend and relative strength to make investment decisions. One positive development uh, that we like is if you look at the NASDAQ 100, which is the US's largest 100 technology stocks, and even if we look at, here's the S&P 500 pie chart, we know that technology makes up the greatest part of the market, about 21% of the S&P 500. The NASDAQ is a good representation of technology stocks and it's making new highs. New price highs, the way I learned it, is not a bearish development, okay? That's a positive development. There's enough buyers to drive price up above a previous high. And we have orange and blue in a positive configuration. Um, that's a positive development. We want technology leading, okay? This is kind of like, you know, if you're watching a baseball game, you want your one through five, one through four hitters to perform well. If your one through four hitters are performing well, typically your offense is doing just, just fine. It's when those top of the order players struggle, okay, that, you, that you're gonna see the team struggle. And so here we're seeing the NASDAQ 100 breaking to new highs. That's the leading part of your order doing well. We like that. Semiconductors, uh, everybody's got one in their pocket in your phone. Um, it's a major uh, corollary to market the overall market. When semiconductors are doing well, uh, that's a good sign for the overall market. And it too is making new highs. So that's definitely a positive. We like that. Emerging markets, this is an interesting one. This is, this is a chart that goes back quite some ways, you know, um, I would say uh, almost 15 years. And, you know, if you, I guess if you want to know a technical term, this whole area in here, this is just uh, what we'd call a mess, um, right? This is a market that went nowhere for over 10 years. Can you imagine being invested in that without having some process to navigate it? Um, I can't, it would be, it would be just nothing but, um, uh, heartburn and uh, but that's why we use uh, the adaptive system that's why we use price and trend and what I like highlighting here is you'll notice that um, sellers again show up at the same area over and over and over okay and this has been going on for years uh, a positive development was right in here back in 2017 we broke to new highs okay that's a really good a really good sign we like that and not only that emerging markets had a very significant correction last year and buyers showed up right in the area where we would expect them to this is called polarity an area that was former resistance now becomes support and buyers showed up in that area where we would anticipate them to they didn't have to but they did and now orange is back above blue and the reason why this is important is if you think about managing money and you think about the amount of risk, right? It's not, um, emerging markets is not a low risk area to invest, right? And so if you are investing in emerging markets, that's a sign of risk taking, okay? And you're gonna take on more risk, which is an overall a good sign for stocks themselves. We like that. Let me delete those off the screen. Let's see what we have here next. But we like the, those developments. Here's Europe. This is an interesting one. I haven't heard anybody talk positive about Europe in quite a long time. But here we have European stocks breaking out of a downtrend, orange above blue. It's in a, a positive trend um, regime, if you will. And here we have European financials, which has just been a dog for a long time. This is a massive correction in, from 2018 all the way through 2019. And now we're seeing European financials breaking out. And your, your financials is the biggest area 
uh, sector. If you want to say te if technology is the largest stock sector in the U.S., financials is the largest in Europe. And so you want to see those lead. And so we're seeing European financials breaking out. That is a good sign for Europe, which would also be a good sign for stocks in the world overall. Uh, here's a chart of the S&P 500 uh, on top. And then this one down here, you may think is some type of heart rate monitor, um, but that's not what it is at all. It's a it's, um, percentage of stocks that are above the blue line. Remember we talked about our blue line, the 40 weeks of information um, average, right? So 40 weeks of price averaged, that's what this is. So right now um, we're about 64% of stocks within the S&P 500 are above their blue line or above their 200 day moving average. What you'll see is that these periods where, you know, for example, back here at Christmas, I mean, we were almost 10% of stocks were above their, I mean, so 90% of stocks were below their blue line. That's a significant amount. It's what we call as like a washout, okay? You'll notice these other periods where the percentage of, percent of stocks in that situation, right? that actually were decent periods to purchase stocks, okay? Especially when we saw it pick back up, all right? Not necessarily going down, but on the return back above the 17.5% line was a great time to you know, look to buy stocks, and we saw that again. And now being above the 60% level, that is significant. We like that. Uh, that tends to have a, a, a strong uh, character, or be a strong characteristic for ongoing uh, price movement upwards, but we'll see. But we think this is a positive development to have over 60% of stocks in the S&P 500 above their blue line, especially after what happened last year uh, in the fourth quarter. Definitely a, a good scenario. So that concludes my presentation. We've covered you know, the different aspects of portfolio construction, how we do it a little bit differently. Um, we covered how the adaptive system works with price um, trend and relative strength. We've po covered the positive evidence and the negative evidence in the market currently. But what I encourage you to do is, we and we had some good questions during our live session, but give us a call. You know, if you want to schedule an appointment with us and meet to talk about these things, we can. Or you can just email us at adaptive at clientfirsttaxandwealth.com. That's, that's fine too. But I did want to cover some final thoughts, you know, leave you something, uh, leave you with some nuggets before I, I, I shut the recording down. And uh, this, this one may seem... Um, a little bit odd to throw in here, but this is uh, a couple Sundays ago. Uh, this is my son Elijah. He got confirmed, um, and this is my extended family. And what I th think is awesome about this is, you know, uh, Eli has a, a life race ahead of him. That he, he has a support team, right? This this whole group here is supporting this young man, and that's pretty awesome. He's got a destination from today to the future that he has to navigate. Life, life isn't easy, but he, he has people on his side that are going to support him. You know, he, he has his savior that's going to support him. And I guess the, the, the analogy I want to make, um, and I don't want to make it too serious because it's not as serious as life and death, but when we're in retirement, we have a destination. We've got to get from today to our destination. And it's not always going to be clear sailing, right? There's going to be storms along the way. Life changes, markets change. So do you have a true holistic flight plan? Okay, do you have a way to navigate those changing life environments, those changing market environments? How are you gonna handle that? For us, we use the adaptive system, right? Uh, markets are not our friend. If you want a friend, get a dog. Uh, same thing with flying. It's not always just blue skies all the time. Markets change and we need to be adaptive and land the plane, protect portfolios when it makes sense to protect them. We'd rather be on the ground wishing we were in the air than the other way around. Same thing with markets. And so when we use the adaptive system, leaving you with this again, we're always going ident to identify risk and reward. We're not just going to blindly buy, buy something and own a 60-40 portfolio. We're going to invest with the direction of the trend. We're going to manage risk using weight of evidence and position sizing. We're going to stay disciplined to the system and the hard data. That's what we're going to focus on, and that's how we're going to manage our client assets. So just finishing up, you know, who should use the adaptive investment management system? Of course, we have clients, individual investors. We do um, manage it within 401k plans. We have a process for that. Um, so you can reach out if you're a business owner and you have a 401k plan. Reach out to us. We can help you with that. Same thing with endowments. We have a few of those here. We'd love to help 
uh, charities and those who are trying to do uh, good within their communities or their spheres of influence, uh, we want to protect those assets and also make them grow. I want to make sense to grow so we can use it for that as well. Next month, uh, May 15th, we've got tax case studies, tax strategy, and optimized tax preparation process. That is um, next month, and that's going to be led by Justin, our head of financial planning, and Renee, who's our IRS enrolled agent and, and head of our accounting and tax services. It's going to be a great presentation. A lot of insight from this past tax year, which had some changes with it. And it's really uh, part of what we do here, the true holistic and adaptive processes, right? It's not just an algorithm, okay? It's not just plugging your numbers into a computer and spitting out some charts and, and, and doing that. It, real life is messy, um, and, and we need to account for that. We use our true holistic, our bucket plan, right? Because it helps us reduce stress, worrying about money. Same thing with taxes, helps you get organized in your tax life. And we use the adaptive system to protect you, right? It's your, it's, it's your emotional bodyguard against uncertain markets. Um, and that's the only thing certain about markets is the uncertainty. And we use the adaptive system to protect our clients from that. And it all fits together. I mean, the reason why we do all these different things is to work in our client's best interest, our fiduciary responsibility. It's why we do taxes. It's why we do Medicare planning. It's why we have estate planning. It's why we use adaptive. You know, it, it, it's the complete plan and that's why we do it. So if that's something interesting, interesting to you and you have a piece that's missing or you want us to help put your picture together, uh, definitely reach out to us. You can do that by calling 262-335-1700. You can email us at myteamclientfirsttaxandwealth.com and we do have um, free initial consultations available and we can discuss your goals and objectives. You can get a chance to view the true holistic planning process and potentially how the adaptive system would help you out. So feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to help you out. Um, until next time, I appreciate the time you gave me during this presentation today. Take care.